Thank you so much. So I get to speak first while he stands and watches. I love this. <laughs> Look at me adoringly. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I can do that. It's with sincerity. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm thrilled to see everybody here. Welcome, welcome. This is a wonderful event as we celebrate Women's History Month at the White House. It's so exciting. <laughs> and let me start by recognizing all of the amazing leaders who've taken time out of their very busy days and schedules to be here with us today. We have our cabinet secretaries, Congresswomen uh, and other leaders who were serving as such powerful role models for the next generation. Uh, but we have uh, some of the members of the next generation here as well, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of them as well. We've got young people here from the Girl Scouts uh, from, from Mount Vernon. And from Mount Vernon and Hayfield Secondary in Virginia. From High Point High School in Maryland. From Eastern High School. And Georgetown Visitation here in DC. All of you all stand. Everybody stand. <laughs> I had a chance to meet with each and every one of them to get a hug and a picture, and we talked. They are beautiful. They are inquisitive. Yes, it was a hug. It was a good hug. Um, and what I told them is that they should make sure they take advantage of this evening by making sure that they take time out to meet all of you extraordinary women, right? That they come up and introduce themselves with confidence, and uh, that you make sure you have a little fun, right? So you're going to make that promise. Make sure you get to meet everyone here today. Uh, because today, all of you are jo uh, joining the long line of incredible women who have graced these halls, both as visitors and as residents, um, from admirals and actresses to civil rights pioneers. My good friend Dorothy Height is here. <laughs> Nobel Prize winners, you name it, this house has hosted some of the most accomplished women and some of the most accomplished Americans in the history of this country. Uh, but we're here today not just to pay tribute to leaders and icons and household names. During Women's His History Month, we're also here to honor the quiet heroes uh, who've shaped this country from the very beginning. We honor the women who traveled those lonely roads to be the first ones in those courtrooms, to be the first ones in those boardrooms, to be the first ones on those playing fields, and to be the first ones on those battlefields. We honor women who refused to listen to those who would say that you couldn't or shouldn't pursue your dreams. And we honor women who may not have had many opportunities in their own lives, and we all know women like that. Uh, women who poured everything they had into making sure that their daughters and their granddaughters could pursue their dreams. Women who, as the poet Alice Walker once wrote, knew what we must know without knowing it themselves. All of us are here today because of women like these who came before us. And during this Women's History Month, may we recommit ourselves to carrying on their work for our own daughters and granddaughters, and also for our sons and our grandsons, too. Now, speaking of sons, it is my pleasure to introduce one of the few men in the room. <laughs> my husband and the President of the United States, Barack Obama. That would be Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please have a seat. Well, let me begin by just thanking uh, some of the people who are participating here today. Uh, Michelle mentioned uh, my outstanding cabinet members, uh, the extraordinary members of Congress and people who are in our senior White House team. I also want to thank Ms. Kerry Washington for emceeing today. Give Kerry a big round of applause. There she, there she is. Ms. Catherine McPhee, who's going to be performing a song in the program. Where's Catherine? She's around. She's practicing, getting her. She's here. I just saw her. Uh, Secretary Madeleine Albright uh, is here today. And Ms. Uh, Majda Jamalzada is also going to be here performing a song in the program, so we want to thank her. Give her a big round of applause. And there, then there's this lady here, <laughs> Flotus. That's, that's what we call her, Flotus. Uh, she is, uh, I'm biased, I acknowledge, but I think she's a pretty good first lady. <laughs> what do you think? She's pretty good. I'm very sincere when I look at you adoringly. <laughs> yes. Now, the story of America over the past 200 years, past 233 years, uh, is one of laws becoming more just, of a people becoming more equal, of a union being perfected. It's a story of captives being set free in a movement to fulfill the promise of that freedom. It's a story of waves of weary travelers reconsecrating America as a nation of immigrants. It's a story of our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters making the most of that most American of demands, to be treated the same as everybody else. And it's a story of women, from those on the Mayflower to the one I'm blessed to call my wife who looked across the dinner table and thought, I'm smarter than that guy. <laughs> the story of America's women, like the story of America itself, has had its peaks and valleys. But as one of our great American educators once said, if you drew a line through all the valleys and all the peaks, that line would be drawn with an upward curve. That upward curve, uh, what we call progress, uh, didn't happen by accident. It came about because of daring, indomitable women. Women like Abigail Adams, who brought on the ridicule of her husband, John, by advising him to remember the ladies in our founding documents. Women like the pioneers and settlers who, in the words of one, said, I thought where he could go, I could go. Women like Dorothy Height and Sylvia Mendez and Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem and Sandra Day O'Connor and Madeleine Albright, upending assumptions and changing laws and tearing down barriers. Women like Hillary Rodham Clinton, who throughout her career has put millions of cracks in America's glass ceiling. And it's because of them and so many others, many who aren't recorded in the history books, that the story of America is ultimately one of hope and one of progress, uh, of an upward journey. But even as we reflect on the hope of our history, we must also face squarely the reality of the present, a reality marked by unfairness, marked by hardship for too many women in America. The statistics of inequality are all too familiar to us, how women just earn 77 cents for every dollar men make, how one in four women is the victim of domestic violence 
at some point in her life. How women are more than half the population but make up only 17 percent of the seats in Congress and less than 3 percent of Fortune 500 CEOs. These and any number of other facts and figures reflect the fundamental truth that in 2010, full gender equality has not yet been achieved, that the task of perfecting America goes on, and that all of us, men and women, have a part to play in bending the arc in America's story upward in the 21st century. I'm proud of the extraordinary women and the extraordinary Americans I've appointed to help take up this task. In addition to our outstanding Secretary of State, we've got Hilda Solis serving uh, where the first female Cabinet Secretary, Frances Perkins, once served at the Labor Department. We've got <laughs> we've got Kathleen Sebelius leading our Health and Human Services Department, Janet Napolitano running the Department of Homeland Security, Susan Rice is our Ambassador the United Nations, the chair of my Council of Economic Advisors is Christy Romer. Uh, we've got Lisa Jackson, who's doing great work uh, at the EPA. Uh, we have just extraordinary talent uh, all across this, uh, this administration. And from health insurance reform to climate and energy to matters of domestic policy, uh, I'm seeking the counsel of, of brilliant women. And, that list doesn't include, by the way, the justice I appointed to the Supreme Court, Mr. Ms. So uh, Sonia Sotomayor. So yes, I'm very proud to have appointed so many brilliant women to so many essential posts in our government, but I'm even prouder of what each of them is doing and what all of us are doing to make life better in America and around the world because lifting up the prospects of our daughters will require all of us doing our part. And that's why we've established a new White House Council on Women and Girls, chaired by my friend and senior advisor Valerie Jarrett, that will help make sure that every part of our government is working to address the challenges faced by women and girls. At a time when women are on the verge of making up the majority of America's workforce, the very first bill I signed into law, a bill named after Lily Ledbetter, was designed to help keep America's promise. If you do the same work as a man, you ought to be paid the same wage as a man. <laughs> to help parents balance work and family, we're offering states more support for equality, affordable childcare, and paid family leave. At a time when we are waging two wars, in fighting a global network of hatred and violence. We need the service of all those patriotic Americans who are willing to do their part. And that's why Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, and top Navy officers decided to end an old barrier against women so our skilled and brave Navy women, as well as men, can serve on submarines. At a time when it's still legal for health insurance companies to discriminate against the victims of domestic violence in eight states plus the District of Columbia. We're seeking health insurance reforms that would finally rein in the worst practices of the insurance industry. And I'm also proud to note that I've appointed the first White House advisor on violence against women, Lynn Rosenthal. At a time when the jobs of tomorrow will go to workers with the knowledge and skills to do them, we're ramping up efforts to educate our young people in science and technology, engineering and math, and we're making a special effort to recruit women to those fields because I want to see more teenage astronomers like Caroline Moore. In fact, Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood has launched a new partnership with Spelman College to train women engineers and help put them to work rebuilding our highways and our infrastructure. And since today happens to be International Women's Day, it's also worth mentioning what Secretary Clinton and Ambassador Rice and this administration are doing on behalf of women around the globe. We lifted what's called the Global Gag Rule, the restricted women's access to family planning services abroad.
We're pursuing a global health strategy that makes important investments in child and maternal health. We sponsored a UN resolution to increase protection for women and girls in conflict-torn countries to help make it possible for more women like uh, Mojda, who traveled from Afghanistan to join us here today, to reach for their dreams. We created the first Office of Global Women's Issues at the State Department and appointed Ambassador uh, Moline Verver uh, to run it. We're investing $18 million. <laughs> We're investing $18 million to combat the unconscionable cruelties being committed against girls and women in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And next month, I'll host an entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship summit to help fulfill a commitment I made in Cairo, a summit that will focus in part on the challenges facing women entrepreneurs in Muslim communities around the world. So we're doing all of this not only because promoting women's empowerment is one of the best ways to promote economic development and economic success. We are doing it because it's the right thing to do. I say that not only as a president, but also as the father of two daughters, as a son and a grandson, and as a husband. You know, growing up, I saw my mother dedicate most of her life to promoting the rights and well-being of women overseas, to empowering them to take more control over their economic lives and uh, be able to empower their families as well. I saw my grandmother work her way up to become vice president of a bank in Hawaii, starting as a secretary, never had more than a high school education, but I also saw how she hit a glass ceiling and had to watch as men, no more qualified than she was, uh, rise up the corporate ladder. Before we got to the White House, where we are grateful for the extraordinary support that we received from the White House staff, uh, I'd see the challenges Michelle faced as a working mom. And as usual, she handled it with grace and skill, but she'd be the first one to tell you it wasn't always easy, balancing the responsibilities of being a hospital executive with those of being a mother and sometimes worrying about the girls when she was at work and sometimes worrying about work when she was with the girls. And today, as I see Sasha and Malia getting older, I think about the world that they and all of America's daughters will inherit. And I think about all the opportunities that are still beyond the reach for too many young women and too many of our brothers and sisters, too many of our sisters and, and mothers and aunts, all of the glass ceilings that have yet to be shattered. We have so much more work to do, and that's why we're here today. I think about this because it reminds me of why I'm here. I didn't run for president so that the dreams of our daughters could be deferred or denied. I didn't run for president to see inequality and injustice persist in our time. I ran for president to put the same rights, the same opportunities, the same dreams within the reach of our daughters and our sons alike. I ran for president to put the American dream within the reach of all of our people, no matter what their gender or race or faith or station. And if we can stay true to that cause, if we can stay true to our founding ideals, then I'm absolutely confident that the line that runs through America's story will, in the future as it has in the past, be drawn with an upward curve. And I'm especially pleased that these young ladies are here today because they're the ones who are going to help uh, bend that curve uh, towards justice and equality. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kerry Washington. Good afternoon. <laughs> Happy International Women's Day to everyone. My name is Carrie Washington, and let me first extend a sincere thank you to President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama for having us here today to celebrate Women's History Month and International Women's Day. <laughs> So in celebration of women, we have a remarkable program today. We have former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, 
who as the first woman to serve as Secretary of State broke barriers and served as a true champion for all women worldwide. <laughs> We have the immensely talented singer-songwriter Mojda Jamalzadeh, who joins us here in DC from her home in Kabul, Afghanistan. And we are, of course, very lucky to have singer-songwriter Catherine McPhee, who many of you may know from her incredible performances on American Idol. <laughs> So we are in for quite a treat this afternoon. It is without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Catherine McPhee. All right, well thank you again for having me here at this amazing event and uh, this is a song that I wrote and I think it's just a, a really great song that I think talks about uh, kind of the self-loathing that us women sometimes do and I think that uh, change comes from within and um, this is a song I'd like to sing for you.
Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Madeleine Albright. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Breaking the glass ceiling. Uh, Mr. President and Madam First Lady, dear Michelle, distinguished guests, International Women's Day reminds us of a lesson that we have long since learned but have not yet sufficiently put into practice. The lesson is grounded in principle but also in experience. The principle is that the basic rights and dignity of women and girls should be accorded the same respect as that given to men and boys a principle endorsed over and over again by global conferences and covenants. Our experience is that when women have the power to make our own choices, we will benefit because the chains of poverty can be broken, families grow stronger, environmental awareness deepens, and socially constructive values are more likely to be handed down to the young. This experience has been validated in the life of communities on every continent, and yet women remain in many parts of the globe an undervalued and underutilized human resource, as the President has just said. This is not to say that women have trouble finding work. Often they do the vast majority of the work, but don't own land, aren't taught to read, can't obtain credit, and don't get paid. Women have made great progress in obtaining legal recognition of their rights, but frequently, even when the laws on the books are just, the reality in homes, in homes and villages is not. Appalling abuses are still being committed against women, and these include domestic violence, dowry murders, coerced abortions, honored crimes, and the killing of infants simply because they're born female. Some say, all this is cultural, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. I say it's criminal, and we each have an obligation to stop it. I have been in public life for more than three decades and have attended many events related to international women's rights, and in each, uplifting goals were announced. But our purpose today and tomorrow and throughout this century is not to articulate more promises, but to achieve real breakthroughs by caring about each other, by lifting each other up, and by building an action network that stretches across every border of nation, race, background, and creed. To illustrate, I'd like to offer a poem written by the granddaughter of a community organizer from America's Midwest. Her name is Marge Piercy, and the poem begins with questions. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up. They can bust you. They can break your fingers. They can burn your brain with electricity. They can take your child. They can do anything, and you can't stop them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight. You can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, hope. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. <laughs> With six, you can rent a whole house. 
eat pie for dinner with no seconds and hold a fundraising party. <laughs> a dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter. <laughs> 10,000 power and your own paper. A hundred thousand your own media. 10 million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. And it starts when you say we and know whom you mean. And each day you mean one more. As these words remind us, progress in women's rights occurs step by step, and each victory becomes a platform upon which the next may be built. Our shared task is to keep building until we've raised enough platforms high enough to transform the very horizons of the earth. And in that quest, we invite everyone to help us and caution each that they cannot stop us. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mojda Jamalzadeh. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. President and the First Lady for having me here today. It's truly a great pleasure and honor to be here in front of all of you. Um, I would like to, on behalf of all the women around the world, I would like to thank the First Lady, Mrs. Michelle Obama, for all her efforts and her leadership. And we're thankful that we have such a great role model. I came here from Kabul, Afghanistan, and I'm trying to do everything that I can um, for the women of Afghanistan. Um, I wrote this song, well, my, my father and I wrote this song uh, for the acid victims of Kandahar City. A few young girls were trying to make their way uh, home from school when they got attacked by acid, and I thought I had to do something for them. It's in Farsi, but I hope that you can feel what I'm singing. Thank you. Bulbul Bachama, 
زینب و ناز و مهری بسخن زینب و ناز و مهری بسخن دخترم دختر افغانم من دختری ملک دل ایرانم من دخترم دختر افغانم من دختری ملک دل ایرانم بشکن بال و پرم را بشکن بشکن تاج سرم را بشکن بشکن بال و پرم را بشکن بشکن تاج سرم را بشکن بشکن بال و پرم را مشکن بشکن تاج سرم را مشکن بشکن بال و پرم را مشکن بشکن تاج سرم را مشکن Thank you so much. Thank you. all of you for joining us in this International Women's Day celebration. Um, I want to just thank again the First Lady and President for having us all here today. And um, the, I was speaking with Mojda before the, her performance and she was saying that she wishes we could all understand the words of the song because she's singing They Can't Break Us. And I think there's been so much said today about breaking that glass ceiling that we know why they can't break us because we're too busy breaking that. So continue to go out there and, and do what we're doing. There's so much beautiful power and potential in the room. And in each of us, there's still lots of power and potential. Don't think because you're powerful that you don't have potential or that because you have potential, you don't have power. So thank you guys for being here today to all of our distinguished guests and happy International Women's Day. Thanks. Thank you.